Good morning, church family. I have astonishing good news, a surprise beyond expectation. Christ is risen. He's alive. He is risen indeed. The grave could not contain him. News cannot be hidden. Thanks be to our God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Come, let us worship the risen Lord. We will worship him with joy and thanksgiving.
heaven or on earth like yours. Yours is the name that saves. Yours is the name that raises from the dead. Yours is the name that frees captives, that brings hope to those who are hopeless and light to those caught in darkness. Your name is above every name, Jesus. Your name is why we can sing with confidence and with joy no matter what is happening in the world around us because you are on your throne. You are still king. You are still the most powerful name, and we love you.
It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. Our scripture reading will be taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 35 to 49. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same. But there is one kind of humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is God's word. Would you recite with me the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So church, we have been on a journey through the Apostles' Creed, and today we're going to conclude that journey with the last phrase of the Creed. I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And what I want us to do this morning is to consider the Creed as a Uh, First of all, a description of reality, a description of reality, and then a destiny of glory. That's where we'll zero in on that last phrase, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. So the creed as a description of reality leading to a destiny of glory. First, the description of reality. Uh, What we've learned when we recite the creed is that it begins not with I earn, I work, I labor, I do more, I try harder. Rather, it begins with I believe. I believe. It's a pledge of allegiance of the one triune God 
And it is also, at the same time, a holy protest against the idolatries of this age. The idolatries of consumerism, materialism, racism, uh, oppression. What we're saying when we recite the creed is that we reject those idolatries and for the one true triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. That's how the creed is organized by the Trinity. Uh, but we also learn that the creed is a worldview. The creed is a lens through which we see and interpret life. All of us are interpreters. Uh, we're trying to make sense of all of the experiences and all of the data and all of the information that's coming at us, we're trying to sort them and uh, interpret them because we're interpreters. We don't just experience life. We experience life and then we interpret life. What gives this meaning? And the creed is a lens, a worldview that helps us sift and sort and understand all that's coming at us. And so what we would say is that a worldview answers four key questions. Question number one, how did we get here? What's our origin? Question number two, What's wrong with this world? When you go outside and you see what's going on in the news and in life, you can't help but think you know, something's broken. How did, how did it all get broken? And question number three is, what's the fix? What's the solution? And then question number four is, how does this story end? What is our destiny? How do we get here? What's the problem? What's the solution? What's the end of this story going to look like? And the creed helps us with that worldview because the creed tells us of a loving heavenly father who is the creator God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So as far as the Bible is concerned, the Bible teaches that God is a heavenly father. The God we worship is not the God that Dorothy Sayers describes in her book, The Mind of the Maker. An old gentleman of irritable nerves waiting to beat people who whistle. What do you think you're doing? Stop your whistling. Get off of my front yard. That's not the God of Scripture. Jesus says, when we pray, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, and our loving heavenly Father created all that is seen and unseen. And He created humanity as the pinnacle of creation. Uh, only human life is designated as made in the image of God. We are image bearers of the Almighty. We are icons of the Almighty. And by image bearers, that means that we are oriented to God, oriented to one another, oriented to our environment, to our world. To bear the image of God means that we love like God loves. That's how we're wired. And we love him and love one another and, and express love by stewarding our environment. And you see, the Israelites uh, were forbidden to make graven images because God says, you don't, I don't need any graven images of me. You're my image and you are to bear my image of love and joy and peace and flourishing all throughout creation. But what happened? Human life made like God chose to be God and usurp God's authority and in an attempt to de-God God, to dethrone God, and as a result, life 
fell apart. The sinner won't hold because we're not wired to have uh, heaven and earth depend upon us. And so this is why life is broken. And this is why the catastrophic uh, diseases and, and climatological disasters and, and, and crime and sin flourish because it goes all the way back to the fall in Eden. But God so loved the world. God, who is rich in mercy, sent his only son on a search and rescue mission. Remember the creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He stepped from the heavenly realm into the earthly realm on a search and rescue mission. And we were the objects of that mission. He lived the life that we should have lived but couldn't. And he died a sacrificial death for us to satisfy the justice of God and yet also extend the mercy of God to rebels. And by his death and burial and resurrection and ascension on high, and now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, he has flooded his church with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit unites us even when we are separate from one another. And even now, tens of hun uh, hundreds of thousands of congregations are gathering in homes. Worshiping is going on. Christ is being glorified. And one day, our King, who is not far from us, he will step from the heavenly realm into the earthly realm. And the resurrection of the body, his people receive new bodies, life everlasting types of bodies. Amen. You see, that's a, it's a worldview. It's a worldview that describes our destiny, our story. <laughs> the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 describes our destiny beloved we are god's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is so the description of reality becomes a destiny of glory because our our story ends in glory. Big idea coming your way. When Christ appears, he will change your earthly body into an everlasting glory body. Think about it. That last phrase of the Apostles' Creed, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting invites us to explore the possibilities of a world where you can continue to grow and learn and discover a world that becomes more and more meaningful and purposeful a world without evil a world without tragedy a world without uh, tornadoes and hurricanes and viruses a world without war a world without greed a world without grief because it's a world without suffering, no tears, no mourning, no crying, no shame. Aren't you tired of having to say, I'm sorry? There is coming a world where, where there will be no shame, no struggle, a, a world where work and labor and thinking go unobstructed, a world with unfettered access to the Creator, a world where you will have no desire or inclination to sin because the Creator God will provide everything that we need. God will meet every desire. You will have a body that will never die. That's what's in that statement, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. I, I find C.S. Lewis most helpful here 
the last sentence of the last chapter of the last book titled The Last Battle in his series, The Chronicles of Narnia, says this. Oh, all their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia concerning the Pavenzi children. All their life and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. And now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever in which every chapter is better than the one before. I want to read that story. I want to be in that story. And that's the promise, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Church family, peace is found only in knowing that this world is meant to prepare us for the next and, and, and that the temporary pleasures and pains of this world that they're not our final address we live knowing that the god of grace has lifted us out of this broken world and is right now preparing us for an uh, an eternal destiny for pleasure for uh, for for a uh, uh, a mission for a sense of purpose and meaning that is goes beyond our wildest imaginations. And because of that, we live with hope. Hope in our heart, eyes toward the future, and hands holding this present world loosely. Everything is meant to be preparation for the final destination. The resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Now listen, some, someone may be listening to all this and thinking, Okay, the pastor's crazy. He's just gone crazy. I mean, he's just gone. And that may be true. But consider this. In Acts chapter 26, verse 23, the apostle Paul in the New Testament preached to King Agrippa and uh, that to wily governor named Festus. And Paul said to them in Acts chapter 26, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. I am preaching what was prophesied in the Hebrew scriptures, the, the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead. And when Paul said that, Festus interrupted and said, oh, Paul, you've you're out of your mind, man. You've gone crazy. Your great learning has driven you mad. And Paul said, I am not crazy. I'm not crazy. And I'm not crazy either. The resurrection of the body, the life everlasting, that's our destiny. Our destiny, our destiny is glory. And, well, some say, well, how in the world is that going to happen? Well, that pertains to our scripture reading that we shared earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 35 says, someone will ask, well, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? Now, that really wasn't an honest inquiry because the Corinthians in the first century didn't believe in a bodily resurrection. So they were kind of like, all right. Convince me how this is how's this going to happen? And so Paul and if you knew his re, his conflicted relationship with the Corinthian church, uh, you would understand then why he says you foolish person. He says, look, if you, if you want to know the answer to that question, how are the dead raised? Just go outside and look at the cornfield. Observe both seed and stalk are the same identity, but they're two different bodies. Just different bodies. Verse 36 says, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. So you see, there's a, there's a body that you plant in the ground. 
And that body has to be planted. But when that body, that kernel gets planted, what sprouts is not a kernel, but a stalk. And there are different bodies, but the same identity. And, and it's not just true in the field of corn. It's true just throughout the entire world. Uh, verse 38 says, God gives it a body as he has chosen and to each a kind of seed, its own body, for not all flesh is the same. There's one kind for humans, and another for animals, another for fish, another for birds. There are, verse 40, heavenly bodies, earthly bodies, and, and they possess different glories. The glory of the heavenly is of one kind. The glory of the earthly is of another. There's the glory of the sun, the glory of the moon, the glory of the stars. Star differs from star in glory. And then Paul says, oh, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown, the, earth, the earthy body is sown, it's sown perishable. But what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. So Paul compares the earthly body versus the heavenly body. The body that pertains to the earth versus the body that pertains to the spirit. The natural versus the spiritual body. Verse 44. It is so natural, it is raised spiritual. And then Paul says this, if there is a natural body, then there, there will be a spiritual body because there is a spiritual body. If there is a kernel, there is a stock. That is by design, that is by creation. And just as God created the plant world to have kernels sprout into stocks, and you can't, if you've never seen a stock of corn before, just by looking at that kernel, you couldn't imagine what it could be like. And so it is with your earthly body. Verse 45 says, The first man became a living being. The last man became a life-giving spirit. But it's not the spirit. The stock doesn't come first. The kernel comes first. That's what Paul is saying. And verse 49 says, Whereas we once bore, bore the image of Adam, the man, we will one day bear the body that will reflect the image of Jesus. And Paul says this in verse 50. Here's the deal. Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because it's, it's perishable. Our, our, our future home is imperishable. And the, the, the two are not compatible. They don't sink. They can't. But one day, God will act. That's why Paul says, I tell you a mystery, verse 51. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a twinkling of an eye, in a flash, blink, and God will transform us. It's going to be happening so quickly. You understand? Salvation is not merely the forgiveness of sins. It's a new order of life. One that Christ will share with us. One that Christ has gone before us. Because as he is, we will be. We will worship and reign in glory bodies. And all of this because Christ died, rose, and lives. He is our victory. Verse 55. O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Now, hear me, because this, here's why this matters. This week, this week, families across our country mourned the passing of loved ones attacked by the COVID-19. And, and I'll tell you this, even apart from the catastrophe of COVID-19, in a, just a typical average year in the United States, 2.8 million people die. And in this particular virus, loved ones and friends, I mean, they couldn't, even, they couldn't even go to the funeral service and be inside the funeral home or the church facility. I saw photos of cars that arrived at a parking lot 
And then there was a screen. And they saw the loved one in the casket. And that, that was it. That was as close as they got. Huh. Now let me ask you something. How do you respond to that? What word of hope do you have to those who grieve? T- tell me, please, you have something more than my thoughts are with you. I- is that all you have, really? Church family, we have something more. What we have is spectacular. The glory of the gospel is that God our Father sent His Son into the world to die and rise again, and in doing so, destroyed death, killed death, facilitated the death of death. At at ground zero of Christianity is death. Paul says at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15, 15, that what I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died. So the most important word in the gospel is Christ, but right next to Christ is the word died. You you cannot escape death if you're going to know Christ. Christ alone changes death, transforms the hopelessness of death to hopefulness. Hopeless grief into hopeful grief despair into joy and when i say joy i'm thinking about james chapter one james says count it all joy brothers and sisters when you face trials of many kinds but when james says joy he doesn't mean you won't weep your eyes out he doesn't mean you won't lament and cry out jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, and we will too. But when our bodies are flooded with tears, deep down in our soul, there is a joy that serves as an anchor to the soul because it is anchored to this truth. We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Christ died and rose to transform death from a curse to a reunion, from the beginning of hell to the beginning of a heavenly homecoming. And through the creed, through the content, the truth of the creed, we we see death not as a dreaded punishment, but as a hope-filled purifier. Afflictions, sufferings, death itself, through a gospel worldview, Tell us to rely not on ourselves or anything in this life, but on the God who raises the dead. One author wrote, God brings his people eyeball to eyeball with death. And this is not to instill fear, but it is to awaken confidence in God alone and nothing else. That the God we worship is the God who raises the dead. Death is designed now for believers as a faith producer, not a punishment. (laughs) No one has this news. I mean, no one. Think about it. We, We have phenomenally good news about death that no one else has. With all courtesy, Islam does not have any good news about death no assurance it's just not even a crossing of the fingers hinduism doesn't either maybe you'll come back as a cat and neither does atheism the the world attempts to dull the sting of death to no good because people just don't have good news but we have good news and the good news is this christ has risen, and he has facilitated the death of death. We have phenomenally good news about people who are facing death. And that's why the Apostle Paul says in verse 57, thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, When I think about that phrase, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. I go back to January 11th, 
2016 at 11.59 a.m. When I get a phone call from my doctor and he says to me, we got the results of your biopsy, Randy, and you do have cancer. And that was news I did not want to hear. And that was, that was news that put a brick in the bottom of my stomach. And after I got off the phone with my doctor, I, I called two of my brothers in Christ and I asked them to pray over me. And then it's just like the Lord gave me a gift. <laughs> the gift from his word. Chemotherapy for my soul. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses nine and ten. For God has not destined us for wrath. But to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died. So that whether we live or die. We will be with him. And I've just been nourished by those verses. All throughout my diagnosis. All throughout the successful surgery. All throughout the subsequent follow-up tests, which have um, indicated uh, that cancer is medically undetectable in my body. Thanks be to God. But Jesus promised me, awake or asleep, alive or dead, you're going to be with me, Randy. You're going to be with me. And listen to me. What that means is that Jesus is no less with me now than he will be with me in the new heavens and the new earth. Remember 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are God's children. Now, he's with me, and he is with you too if you are in Christ by grace through faith. But th th there's no other religion on the face of the earth that offers this, none. The, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Do you know this? Do you know this? Do you know him? Do you want him? He's the only one who can transform this earthly body into an everlasting glory body. And if you want him, I plead with you right here, right now, Fall on your knees and cry out to Jesus. Lord, remember me. I need you. I want you. Be my leader. Be my king. Be my emperor. Rule my life. Be the center of my life. Order the chaos of my life. Give me peace, please, Jesus. Forgive my sins. Bring me into your kingdom. I, I promise you, if you will pray that prayer, that he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Those who believe in him, those who receive to them, he's granted to become children of God. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your mercy. Thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, 
you, you're all we have. You're the only one who can bring order and light to the disorder and darkness in life. Thank you that you have gathered us as your people. And thank you for the promise. This life is not all there is. There is this life and the life to come. And we eagerly await your appearing. Sustain us now, Lord Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Not by might, not by power, by your Spirit, God. Send your Spirit, God. Not by might, not by power, by your Spirit, God. Send your Spirit.
morning, church family. My name is Kurt Glosser, and I have the privilege of serving as one of your elders here. Now is our time for communion, where we pause and remember what Christ did for us on the cross. You can now pause the video and gather your elements. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 22. We're going to start in verse 8. Luke chapter 22, verse 8. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. Jesus is giving Peter and John directions for preparing the Passover meal. Can you imagine uh, the scene here? This is another miracle, a gift from God that he's provided them. At a time where the high priest and the Jewish religious leaders are trying to track down Jesus and arrest him, They are protected. The place where they will gather together and partake of this Passover feast, that location is kept until right before. Jesus' arrest will be in God's timing. Right? God is in control. Again, imagine the scene. The disciples are worrying about the persecution. They're fearful of what is next in the future. Can we relate? And God is always in control. Amen. I call this a gift from God because in verse 15, it says, He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Eagerly desired. Have you ever had one of those moments where you're with a group of people and you know that's probably the last time that you'll all be gathered together? Maybe it was a high school graduation party. Maybe it was during a short-term mission trip. The last night in country gathered together with the team and the missionaries. Maybe some of us are feeling like that with the shelter-in-place order. Jesus was gathered together with his 12 closest friends. The men that he's worked with for the past three years, serving every day, eating every meal, and now this is their last meal, the Last Supper. Let me read as we partake and remember. Verse 19, he took the bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it, giving it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant. In my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for eagerly desiring us so much that you came to earth. Thank you for taking our penalty on the cross, for absorbing God's wrath for our unrighteous choices. Thank you for your sacrifice and for your never-ending love. Amen. For our offering meditation, I'm going to start where we left off, the Last Supper. Again, imagine the scene. Christ is gathered with his disciples uh, there for the Last Supper. Jesus talks about his death, and everyone knows that this is probably the last time that they're going to be together. He predicts his betrayal. Not the most upbeat dinner conversation, right? But as all good leaders do, Christ gave him a vision of the future, right? He talked about the future that spoke hope into the disciples' heart. And hopefully as we read his words here, it speaks hope to your heart, to your spirit this morning. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Christ left the disciples here on earth because there was work 
to be done. They needed to go and tell what they've seen, what they had heard, testify about what they experienced. God has left us here to do the same. We are here because God expects us to testify what we've experienced. At this time of offering, I ask, how are we going to be good stewards of what God has given? Man, I was encouraged last week, and uh, Pastor Randy showed the pictures of all the food that was laid out on the tables in the foyer. And the church was able to feed over 40 local families. Did you know last week, because of your generosity, uh, we are able to partner with Unit 4 Schools to feed the local kids for the next 12 weeks. Because of your generosity, we were able to send monetary gifts last week to our partners in Kenya and Peru. Even though we were unable to send teams this year, we're still able to send those gifts, your gifts, to encourage, to uplift, to support, to partner in the ministry that those missionaries are completing on the field. Thank you. Thank you for your gifts today. Let's pray for this offering. Dear Lord, thank you for the many blessings you have given us. Thank you for providing and for caring for our needs. Please take these gifts that are given today and accomplish your kingdom's work that you have called this church to do for your glory. Amen.
Church family, uh, how grateful I remain to be your pastor. I am praying for you without ceasing, and I just want to reach out to those who may have uh, made a decision to be a Christ follower, to receive Jesus. Would you please let me know of your decision? Randy at WindsorRoad.org. Randy at WindsorRoad.org. I will follow up, and we just want to connect and help you in your journey as a believer in Christ. Also, um, for our church family, I just want to continue to remind you that there are so many ways that we can serve, especially in this season. For instance, please do your grocery shopping at Salt and Light. Uh, you'll get what you need there, and you'll contribute to the vital ministry of coming alongside and empowering the lives of image bearers. Our own food pantry continues Monday through Thursday, 9 to 4 by appointment, and we remain grateful for your continuing provisions. Uh, God has given through our offerings $20,000 for uh, relief, specifically for food during COVID-19. And our benevolence ministry uh, remains ready to help those in our congregation who are struggling in this time. Contact WindsorRoad.org, WindsorRoad.org, that's our website, and there is an opportunity to serve our community through the See You Better Together initiative as we partner with over 20 congregations and not-for-profits in our area to meet needs with love as we distribute food to families of children in our school district. So we will be at Garden Hills Academy tomorrow. I'd like you to go to our website and sign up there to uh, volunteer Monday morning. WindsorRoad.org to sign up. I'll see you tomorrow morning. For our benediction, I'll be taking it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. And the church said, Amen.